You're listening to Brandon Sports Talk, interviewing professional athletes and Paralympians and Olympians. And now for your professional athlete interview and your host, Brandon P. Welcome back to Brain of Sports Talk. In today's episode, I have the privilege to interview the USA's Taekwondo Olympian, Nia Adala. How are you doing today? I am awesome. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Can you talk about how you knew that you wanted to get started into the sport of Taekwondo? Um, so it was funny. Uh, growing up, I think I knew I wanted to be an Olympian before I wanted to be a Taekwondo Olympian. Um, but uh, I discovered Taekwondo in the weirdest way. Growing up, I was doing all kinds of sports. Um, I was a super athletic kid, liked to do a lot of things. Um, but my mom, of course, wanted me to do some of the more girly sports. So she put me in like uh, 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 gymnastics and softball and things that she thought, volleyball, things she thought were a little bit more girly. Um, but I grew up on Ninja Turtles and uh, Power Rangers and all, and the Karate Kid. Um, and so when she and my stepfather got married, me and him got together to convince her to let me try a summer program for Taekwondo. Um, and the funny part about that was we kind of um, told her all the things that she kind of learned that I was going to be kind of a little, um, have all the discipline and be able to uh, be able to fight back if uh, I got bullied. You know, we really sold her the story of martial arts. Um, and so she agreed to a summer program that was supposed to be uh, just three months, um, $500. She agreed to that. And now she calls it the summer program that never ended. And from day one, I fell in love with the sport. Um, I didn't quite know that it was going to be my sport that I was going to go to the Olympics with um, at the moment, because when I started, it wasn't an Olympic sport. Um, but I knew that I loved it. And I knew that I was really good at it from a really young age. Of course, what was that like getting started at such a young age of nine? The funny part is I was actually pretty old uh, when it comes to Taekwondo. A lot of people start when they're five, six, seven years old. Um, so I was playing catch up. Uh, a lot of people were way younger than me um, in higher belts. Um, but starting at that age, I was super athletic, so I loved it. Um, and I was in a unique place where um, I wasn't the youngest, but I wasn't the oldest. Um, so I got to learn a lot from, uh, you know, sparring and working out with younger, faster kids. And then a lot from the smartness of uh, older, more mature uh, athletes. So um, being starting at nine kind of gave me a unique perspective where I got the best of both worlds of what it's like to be young and old in the sport. What was that feeling like getting to compete in Taekwondo competitively at an older age? Um. So... When I first started off, I kind of started doing, uh, you know, different tournaments super, super early. And so when I was younger, it was fun. Um, and I, this is what I always tell people when they're like, what's your biggest advice? I'm like, have fun. Um, because I had fun all the way through from the very first local tournament to all the way to the Olympic Games. Um, it was all about me having fun. When I wasn't having fun, that meant it was time for me to be done with the sport. And so it was fun. And I started winning super, super early. Like my very first nationals, I think I was, I had only been doing Taekwondo for like six or seven months. And after those six or seven months, I uh, won double gold. And so I was really, really good, really, really early, um, especially when I was younger until I got around 14 when it was time to make kind of national team, a uh, junior national team. Um, and I started losing. I started uh, not being the best um, at every tournament. Uh, but I am thankful for those times because those times are what made me the champion I am today. It gave me that work ethic. I think if I would have been doing good all the way through through the Olympics, I don't think that I would have had the um, work ethic that I ended up getting. Uh, so I, I became kind of the underdog of everything when I started losing and not making any national team. Um, and it made me work super hard. I was the first one there, last one to leave. What was that feeling like for you to make that senior national team for the first time and represent Team USA? 
so it's that that is funny that you ask that because I did things backwards. Um, so my very first team is what's called the Pan Am Games team. And for the people that don't know what the Pan Am Games team, uh, it's like the Pan American region, so North America, South America, Central America Olympics. So all sports go to this event. We have opening ceremonies just like the Olympics, but it was for the Pan American region. This is the first time I made a new team. Um, and so at 19 years old, I'm the only one. Everybody on my team are Olympians, world champions, uh, people that have been on national team for 10 years. And I'm just this little girl that's never done anything. Um, and so it was it was it was a fun experience to experience that um, first, especially before going to the Olympics, um, to be able to, you know, see these other sports and um, get friends from other sports. There's people like Andre Ward, who is a professional boxer that I met at the Pan Am Games and because of, of those experiences. Um, and then my very next team was the Olympic team. Um, and so, like I said, I did things backwards. Mind you, I had never made a collegiate team, never made a junior team, never made a senior team, but I made the two bigger teams uh, of, of Taekwondo. Um, and then after the Olympics, after getting my silver medal, um, that's when I made my first national team. Um, and it was an interesting place to be there because me getting a silver medal was kind of a shock to the world. Um, nobody expected me to do that. So I come home from being a nobody they barely just just got on the scene to now I'm one of our Olympic medalists. And so I felt an obligation um, during that time to kind of be a leader leader. Um, and not just, you know, in, in Taekwondo and, and when we're out there fighting, but be a leader in general um, and, and try to gain experience in that leadership. And, it, and I ended up being kind of the team captain um, for the rest of the teams that I were on. Uh, so I kind of did it in a unique way where my first was, um, not necessarily coming in as a rookie. Of course, what was that experience like doing it the opposite way and not coming in as a rookie and going through co the college ranks of Taekwondo? Um, the funny part is that's kind of my MO <laughs> in life. Uh, this is how I live life. Um, so it wasn't weird to me, but it did give me um, a, a sense of being a role model a lot earlier in my career than I would. I mean, I was, I was, I was a role model before I even competed to go to the world championships. Uh, so it gave me that sense of being a role model. Um, and I was thankful for that because at 19, 20, 21 years old, um, I could have gone left, but because I had that sense of being a role model, I watched what I do. Um, I was really, really, uh, uh, aware of, you know, the words that I say, the actions that I did, because I knew it could affect people. Um, and I think a lot of people that do it the opposite way don't do that. Like they go in there, um, they're like, oh, nobody knows who I am anyway, so I can do whatever I want. But me doing it backwards and being on a big stage so fast gave me kind of a sense of, you know, every, there's people looking up to me. How was that experience like for you getting to go to the U.S. Opens and getting to go multiple times through 2001 through 2003. So that was uh, amazing. Like I said, I do things backwards. Um, so the U.S. Open happened uh, before I even competed in my first uh, senior day. So again, I do things backwards. I tend to do things. And I won. Uh, oddly enough, I won uh, U.S. Open. And it was just a tournament. We So when we do, we, we do, normally we do kind of state tournaments or back in the day, it was state tournaments and then national tournaments. And then people will do US Open as a kind of way to get international experience without going overseas. And so I was um, connecting with some people and they're like, we're going to this US Open tournament. Do you want to go? It was supposed to be me just getting experience. I'm 17 years old the first time I go. So it's like, just go there and get some experience, you know, for the future. Little did they know that I was going to mess around and win the whole thing. Uh, and um, compete, and so that was my birth, my first uh, introduction to 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 the world in the senior stage. People kind of knew who I was, but not really because I hadn't won anything. But winning U.S. Open kind of put me in the forefront going into nationals, um, and then that's kind of what catapulted me to be being able to go to the Olympic Training Center after I graduated high school and be able to train not only amongst the, the best in Taekwondo, but the best in the world in all types of sports and being in that atmosphere of greatness um, really impacted me and helped me to, you know, be a better fighter, a better person. What was that like, not just winning one U.S. Opens, but winning three U.S. Opens in a row? 
the funny part about it was it it didn't feel like a big seat. It felt like what I was supposed to do. Like, um, and that's what all the tournaments, people always ask me the same thing about the Olympics, the same thing about, you know, all these other tournaments. I was like, I, every tournament I went to, I was supposed to be winning those tournaments. Like, that's why I went there. And so getting medals or winning in these tournaments didn't feel like, oh my God, you did something great. I did my job. Um, and so I went in those tournaments and after winning the first one, um, it kind of gave me a target on my back and I was just like, okay, now I need to win this. Now I need to show if I'm not making national teams, I can at least show the world that, you know, I can compete on a bigger stage um, against international fighters. Of course, in the 2003 U.S. Open, what was that feeling like getting to win it? And when did you realize that you made it to, to make it onto the Olympic roster? Yeah, so in 2003, that was, um, you know, I was already working towards being going to the uh, Pan Am Games. So was, that was the same year. Um, and so in my head, I felt like I was supposed to be here. I was supposed to be competing on that international stage. Um, and so winning that third one kind of solidified that and it was a great way to go into kind of the Olympic process. Um, and then after after 2003, we went through a whole Olympic process where um, we had to qualify uh, for the country. And the, to break it down how it works now, it doesn't work the same way now. Um, it's a little bit different now um, in Taekwondo, but when my year, they had two ways for you to qualify your country and yourself uh, for the Olympics. So a lot of people don't know um, most sports and most athletes have to qualify first before they can even get their spot to go to the Olympics. And so we had two opportunities to qualify. The first opportunity is on the world stage. Um, the rules for that one is if you qualify the country, you qualify yourself. I unfortunately did not make weight for the team trials to compete against uh, other U.S. people to make the team to, to go to the world version. Um, luckily, they somebody the person that did make it did not qualify, and so we had a second chance in the Pan American region. The caveat to that was for the Pan American region, you only qualified your country; you did not qualify yourself. And so that was my first kind of taste of putting my country on my back. Um, and then I went in, I went in and qualified for the spot, but that still meant I had to come back to America and. Um, fight off for my spot and so that's what I did um, we had multiple tournaments um, ending with me uh, winning in sudden death um, and making the team um, and that moment was a great moment for me um, it was one of those because I, I had finally made you know uh, to the world show the world that I could be the best in the U.S. and not just win internationally but um, beat the best of the best um, and that moment was a great moment but it also was a moment that I realized that I had another job to do. Um, and so I got super focused on the job at hand um, and, and what that meant, what that meant to be an Olympian. And um, luckily I had some people that were past Olympians in Taekwondo to kind of take me under my wing and um, keep me humble, but tell me what I have in front of me and how to enjoy every moment, not just the tournament, but every moment from opening ceremonies to um, meeting other athletes, the Olympic Village to um, meeting other international uh, athletes. Um, so I got to really enjoy those moments because somebody sat down and said, slow down, um, and this is what's coming in front of you. Of course, once you made that Olympic team to go to Athens in 2004, what was that feeling like in getting to Athens and getting to compete on the biggest stage? So again, I, ha I got super lucky um, with that, in between the time that I qualified the country and had the tournament to qualify myself, um, we have the Olympics have what's called a, a test event um, where they'll come and they'll bring the, they, they want to see how the event will run. And so people from a, a multiple countries get to come from different sports and kind of test out the venue and go to the place. So I got to go to Greece uh, in like February of 2004 and uh, compete in the test event. Um, and so I got to get all the sightseeing out of the way and um, really experience Athens and get all that, you know, amazement out. And I, one thing that I got to do was because this was the first time I was competing on a world stage, not just a Pan American region stage, I got the jitters of um, that the world is so much better than me. And so I lost the, I lost my very first fight. But what I learned in that loss um, was that they weren't that good like they weren't that much better than me like they they, they I, I could beat these people and so because I got that experience once I made the team I knew that I was I was good enough um to get out there and actually win and compete against um these other people around the world 
once you did get to Athens and you competed in the Olympics, what was that experience like for you getting to compete in the Olympics and being at the top of your career? Um, these it, That's a two-parter. So when it comes to the tournament part, uh, what I always tell people is that felt like the next tournament. Um, so I explained to you how we had all these other events that we had that led up to these. So it's kind of like um, the first time you go to a national competition, um, going from uh, junior, um, from state to nationals, it, it's bigger, but it just feels like the next step. And so the Olympics felt like the next step. The tournament felt like the next step. I'm also the kind of person that likes to be watched. Like a lot of people, uh, when they're watched, they're like getting nervous to make a mistake. But my brain goes, everybody's watching. I can't make a mistake now. like that. I have to do it now. And so right before I competed, somebody told me that like millions of people are going to be watching me on TV. And that lit a fire under me. I'm all like, okay, I'm here now. Like, I can't mess up now. I got to win because people are watching. And so um, the tournament side of it felt like the next tournament. I felt like I was supposed to be there. I belonged there. Um, the, the other side of it was just the experience of the Olympics. That was super cool um, because I got to see people that I looked up to. I got to see the Serena's and Venus's. And I got to see um, the the uh, the Marion Jones. And I got to see the Lisa Leslie's and the Tamika Catchings. I got to see all these people that I literally grew up watching um, being my peers. Uh, and that was so cool um, to know that, you know, I've made it to a point where, um, and I think that's what humbled me about, like somebody else is watching me. Um, I always tell people this story about Marion Jones. I grew up a big Marion Jones fan growing up. Um, I've been following her since she was in high school all the way to I'm a Tar Heel fan um, because she went to North Carolina. Um, and she was there. That was her last Olympics. And um, for Taekwondo, we have weight limits. And so I was trying to lose weight uh, for my weight limit. And I think I had like five more pounds. And I'm in a sweatsuit outside. It's 100 and some degrees running. And uh, apparently, she, she was about to start working out. And she saw that I was not having a good time. And so she yells across the uh, field, keep going. It'll all be worth it at the end. And I talked to her afterwards and tell her how much that meant to me. But that gave me so much power when when the person that has been literally your idol um, is telling you that it's all worth it in the end. Um, that did so much for me. Um, it helped kind of get me to finish what I was doing and go win. And then afterwards, I'm all like, how much does my words mean to other people? And so the experience of like now becoming somebody that people look up to was amazing and uh, kind of the past the torch. Um, because I really, really got to see people that I looked up to be, you know, equal to me or my my peers. Of course, what was that experience like getting to see those people that you look up to and seeing them in competitions competing against you or with you? Um, it was just amazing to see. Like it was it, it was a I have arrived moment for me. Like it was um I, I think I don't think that I realize it as much in the moment as I do kind of in hindsight you know I'm, this has been almost 20 years ago um but at that age it was it you know it was a great experience I think that that was the part of it even though I love the tournament I love that I got a silver and all that stuff that was the part of it that um I enjoyed the most about the whole experience and even afterwards just being able to be in the same room I had I got to have conversations with um Layla Ali about uh, that the fact that she don't want to fight me in, in uh, Taekwondo and I don't want to fight her in boxing. Um, to be able to be in those rooms and have those conversations with people, um, that was kind of the best part. It, uh, I, I can't say that enough that um, that was the part that kind of changed my my worldview in my life. What was that feeling like getting to put on that silver medal around your neck and knowing that all of your hard work paid off? So the crazy part about that was I was not happy. Um <laughs> Um, I always tell people, anytime you watch the Olympics um, go, and you're looking at opening ceremony, look at second place. Um, second place is a weird place to be when it comes to that level, um, because you got to think about it. Of, of course, first place is super happy that they won. Third place is happy that they made the podium and they're not like the rest of the people that didn't make the podium. But second place um, is literally uh, inches away from the what the, what the ultimate goal was. And so... I was super, super upset. I used to tell people when they said congratulations, I'd be like, for what I lost. Um, <laughs> I used to be super, super upset with that because my goal was to win. Um, and so getting that second place. And then one thing that people don't know is like all that stuff happens super fast. Like it goes from 
you lose the fight, then your the cameras are stuck in your face, and you got to interview. You go back, you change, and then you get on the court. And so I had no time to kind of really soak in that I won a silver and not that I lost the gold. And so it took me a while, way after, maybe six months after, to realize that um, I actually like won a silver and not lost the gold. Um, but um, you know, it was a it was a fun moment, and I didn't know I didn't know a lot of the things that were happening. Like we went going to the interviews, mind you, this is new for me. So I didn't know about going to the interviews afterwards and having to like sit at the table and have conversations. Um, I didn't even know we got money for the medal. Like that's how wet behind the ears I was. Like <laughs> somebody told me after I got the medal that I was getting money for it. So um, it was, I was trying to win. Uh, and so I was upset about not winning. Um, but then after I kind of sat back and let it soak in, I realized that I did some things that a lot of people haven't done and some things that um, it wasn't until last Olympics that my record was broken. So breaking records and doing all that stuff and um, later on giving the recognition made it soak in. But in that moment, I was mad. I was super upset. <laughs> of course, what was that like getting to set the record and seeing it not be broken until this previous Olympics? Um, It was proud, but in a weird way, like I was looking for the next person to do it. Like I felt I thought I was going to be sad when um, we had a gold medalist. So that, the record is um, the uh, I, I was the only finalist um, and the highest medal female medalist is still, uh, Taekwondo has become a uh, official sport. Um, and uh, when she got the gold, I felt a sense of relief. Um, and I was proud that I held the record, but I was proud that somebody could break it. Like uh, I, I think as athletes, we want you know the sport to get better and. Uh, somebody else to come out and, and make the sport better and a bigger name. And so I was super excited for it, I'm more excited than I thought I was going to be because I thought I was going to be upset. Because, you know, when you go to record, you're like, mm, I want my record. And so now when I see like track and field people when their records or basketball people when their records get broken, I, I understand how you can be proud, sad, happy, emotional, all, all that in one. Um, because it, at the end of the day, when you had your record, you had your record. Um, and you'll still be in the history books for it. And so uh, it wasn't as sad as I thought it was going to be. Of course, as you talked about that, how does it feel to still know that you will be down in the history books, even though the record is currently with somebody else? I mean, it's super proud. And there's some records that just won't be broken. Um, I'll still be the first. Um, I'll still be, you know, uh, th th still, I'll be the first woman, the first African-American I'll be the youngest uh, one. Like there's there's still some records that um, I still have in the books um, because I was the first to do it. Uh, so it, 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 it really doesn't take anything from me. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, the funny part is I thought it would, and it really doesn't. Um, and uh, it's exciting to continue to have those records in the books, um, but also build on the rest of my life um, and see what I can do outside of that and see how I can encourage people from um, what I did um, in, in, in the future. Of course, for my listeners that don't know, how do you get to compete in Taekwondo? Um, so now it's a little bit different than what it was back then, but uh, for Taekwondo, there's kind of levels. I mean, when you're first starting off, you kind of do the local levels, and then there's like states or regional competitions. Um, and then, then you have kind of the national competitions. Then you have team trials. Um, now it's a little bit different where people have to, you know, get points from uh, competing internationally. But for us back then, it was more of you have to fight these tournaments. Um, and so as you win tournaments, you just kind of go to the next level. Um, and according to whatever the um, rules are for that year, you just kind of have to follow those rules. Like I said, back then it was fight a certain tournament. Now it's get a certain amount of points um, to be on the team. Uh, and so you just have to go through that process. Uh, you have to be through um the USA Taekwondo uh, Association um and do tournaments through them in order to get to the Olympic level because they're the ones that are under um US Olympic and Paralympic committees. Of course what was that feeling like getting to put on your Taekwondo uniform and getting to represent Team USA? Um that's such a surreal moment. Uh like I don't think people really understand how much it changes when you're going for your country. Like we have a lot of turmoil here in the country against each other, and we're fighting women versus men, and different races are fighting, and uh, Democrats versus Republicans, but that goes away. 
uh, when you're competing on the Olympic stage, like you represent the United States, like uh, like everything that you do, your character, if you win or lose, like you're representing. Um, and then everybody there, like these are my teammates um, that are competing in totally different sports. Like it, it's just a different level of pride for your country. And I'm a Texan. And so we have a lot of Texan pride, like here in Texas. Um, if you know anything about Texan, you know, we, we are here for our own. Um, and I felt like that same thing for America, no matter what I, I've had issues with, with people or anything that's happened in the country, like putting USA on my back and knowing that like I'm representing a strong country, uh, I'm representing a country that demands respect and I'm helping it demand respect um, was a cool, cool, cool feeling. What was that feeling like getting to put on the Olympic rings on your Taekwondo uniform when you were at the Olympics? Um, the So the cool thing about the, the Olympic rings and during the Olympic time is they're everywhere. Like it's not just putting on your uniform, but we get so much clothes. Like I had uh, shirts and I have bags and, and umbrellas and so many things that now I have permission to put it on. Like I have the like it's a seal. Like I I, now, I have one tattoo and it's a tattoo of my Olympic race. Um, and because it's now like a part of me, like this, I'm part of this cool club that only a few people uh are is a part of. So having those rings like still today, like I I wear those like a badge of honor. Like they nobody can ever take that from me that I'm an Olympian. I'll be I, that's actually the Olympic model. Once an Olympian, always Olympian, never former, never past. And so I'm a part of this unique club. And um, from, from the moment that I made the team, like I knew I was a part of this unique club that some of the greatest people and greatest athletes that we know have been a part of. And so it's cool to be a part of that club. As an athlete, what, does, what is that like, obviously, to be a part of that Olympic club and have OLY behind your last name? Um, it, it's it's a, a big sense of pride, but I feel like it shows that um, a, a part of my character is that I am a hard worker. Um, I am willing to, you know, do the go the extra mile. Um, I feel like it helps with knowing who I am. Um, not just that I kick people, but that I'm willing to do the work. Um, that I'm I'm willing to see things differently. I've been uh, I've experienced things that most people haven't. Um, and then I always tell people I'm I I, I see myself as the positive side of any statistic. So. Because I I I beat the statistic of the Olympics, I think it's one in one point two million or something like that. Um, any statistics, if you say only three percent of people do that, like I I I beaten worse worse odds. If you only say uh forty percent of them do it, I'm beaten worse odds. And so one of my life models is I'm beaten worse odds because you can't find a lot of scenarios where it's statistically harder to do than what I've done for the Olympics. And so in general, it just helps me look at life like, okay, you can beat any odds, you can beat any statistics. Um, and I always believed that I could. I, I told my mom I wanted to win the Olympics at nine years old. And so I've been believing that I could be the statistic that most people didn't believe they could. And so I try to live that in my life and try to beat statistics um, in general with everything that I do. Of course, what would you tell your nine-year-old self looking back on your career, knowing that now you are an Olympian? Um, what would I tell my nine-year-old self? I'll just tell them to do what you need to do, keep doing and have fun. I mean, when I tell you having fun was such a key part of what I did, of course I trained hard. Of course I sweated and I had tears and I was hurt and I did all those things, but I had fun. And so making sure that I had fun, I think there were some moments where I kind of lost sight of that Um, as I was losing a little bit later when I was telling you I was losing before. Um, making the team I lost sight of that and what got me back was the fact that I decided that I was going to have fun no matter what and so having fun was a key to my success um, and I feel like it's a key to success um, in general um, with life I, I live by a motto called Bacho um, where it comes from is Taekwondo we, we yell when we uh, do things and during the 90s it was kind of cool to be like Pacho Bacho um, say different ones and so me and a couple of my friends Started to say bacho as a joke. Um, and so I started using it as a model when I retired um, to as a thing to uh, show how I became what I was and how I can do that in the future because it stands for believe, associate, choose, hone, and obtain. And so um, because I believe that I can be successful, I associate those things that I can be successful in. 
Um, I I uh, choose to do the work. I hone in on that, and then I take I grab it when I get there. And I'm, I I feel like those are the steps that made me successful, and the steps that are going to continue to make me successful. What was the feeling like getting to live out your Olympic dream? Um, it was bittersweet because, like I said, my dream was to win the Olympics. So <laughs> it was bittersweet to be able to live out the Olympic side of it, but not necessarily the the obtaining the win side of it. Um, and I I love that I get to be a part of that. Um, but I, there's also like what I lost by one point. Um, in the tournament, so there's all those what ifs um still in there. So it's it's super bittersweet. I I'm proud of myself. I still think that uh, my four year old self and my nine year old self would still be proud of me. Um, but it definitely is bittersweet because um I was so close to obtaining what I really really wanted to obtain. What was that feeling like at the Olympics, having that mama I made it moment throughout the Olympic experience? Um, it, it it's it's interesting you ask that because I fed off of the fact that people thought I couldn't do it. Um, and so when I did it and people started cheering me on, it took me a while to get used to that. Like, because I was the underdog for so long, like after the Olympics, people were like, yeah, Nia's great. And I'm all like, what? Like, Y'all not going to tell me I'm going to lose? Like, all through the Olympics, there people were saying that, like, I was lucky to make the team, and I wouldn't get past the first round, and, you know, I'm I'm not that good. All those things were fueling me. And so, like, I didn't have that fuel anymore. So it actually was a, like, scary moment to be in a place where people actually believe in you and not not doing it to prove them wrong, but doing it just to show um, just myself and um, show that I, you know, am good and that I'm doing the work. So it was... It was a weird backwards wrong woman, you know. I, I keep saying I do things kind of backwards in my world. <laughs> of course, what does it mean for you to be a Taekwondo athlete and an Olympian? Um, to be a Taekwondo athlete, um, it's a little bit different than other sports because when I with our sports, um, there's some history behind it and um there's some kind of tenets behind what we do. Taekwondo has um taekwondo tenets uh that show us who we should be as a person. And so being a Taekwondo athlete, I always tell people Taekwondo is not just an Olympic um, sport, but Taekwondo is a sport for anybody. And you can be four years old or 104 years old and still do Taekwondo. And so um, I love that I'm a part of sport that um, is, is, is timeless um, and teaches things outside of the sport. And then being able to be an Olympian on there and show that, you know, we can compete and we can be entertaining on the sports side of it. Uh, I feel like I got the best in both worlds with, with my sport where um, I can do kind of both sides of it, where I can be a part of something so traditional um, and so um, unique in what it does um, and still be a part of this Olympic family. What is it like to, getting to meet your fans and having them ask for your autographs and photos with you? Super weird. <laughs> like, it is super, super weird. Still now, if I get like, every once in a while I get spotted like when I'm out and about, um, it's super weird. I think the weirdest one was somebody uh, was crying when they saw me. Um, but it's funny because I cried when I saw Marion Jones. So like it was mind blowing for me to see somebody that's like that. And even to this day, like anybody is like, oh, I've been looking at you um, before I retired. The girl that um, I the final girl that I lost to used to have my poster on the wall. Um, and so. Um, it's it, it's always been weird. It's, I think it's always going to be weird. I always tell people I'm glad that I'm only kind of famous. I don't know if I can handle being real famous uh, where I can't go nowhere. Um, but it's weird every time that I get recognized or um, that people, you know, want to autograph and all that stuff because I, I feel like a regular person uh, and then I do regular stuff. Um, so it's super, super weird still. Who are some of the people that you look up to in the sport of Taekwondo? Um, in Taekwondo, um, it's mostly kind of some of the older athletes like the Barb Kunkels or the Lynette Loves or the Ar Arlene Lemuses. Um, those are the people that, so the way that Taekwondo worked was, um, it was kind of a, uh, a demonstration sport in 88 and uh, 92. Um, and then it was taken out and then it was made official in 2000. And so the one, those, those, some of those names are the people that paved the way for me. Um, that made, they did the, the sacrifices to make it that it would be an official sport. So um, all those women that were the, the, the uh, uh, all the May Payos, 
um, all those women that kind of did that in one and showed like the U.S. was dominant on the women's side um, and showed that, you know, we can we can do this and the sports should be in, in Taekwondo. Like, I think if they wouldn't have won, Taekwondo wouldn't have gone in the Olympics. And so they they basically laid the path for me to be able to do the things that I did. So those are the people that I really looked up to um, when it came to Taekwondo. Who are some of the influential people in your career that have shaped you into the Taekwondo athlete that you are today? Um, I got, uh, I think all the masters and, and coaches that I've had um, helped me in different ways. I've had um, the people that gave me the fundamentals. I've had people that showed me how to be strong. I've had people that showed me how to be quick. Um, I've had people show me how to be smart. I had people show me how to have more technique, ring management. Um, so I think I'm a, I always call myself a sponge. I, I, I ring up everything and I, I squeeze out what I don't need. Um, and so my fighting style has always been a mixture of all the people that have taught me, whether it was um, my actual coach or people that I was training with that had this one cool kick and that I, that taught me how to do that one cool kick that I can add to what I have. So I can't even say that it was one person. It was so many people that poured into me um, that I was able to utilize and uh, be who I was by the end of my career. What are some of your favorite memories and moments competing in Taekwondo? Um, I think some of my best moments or my favorite moments were kind of being able to travel around the world. Um, that gives me some such a better perspective of, you know, where I'm at in in the world and compared to and where, where the U.S. is in the world. Um, and so being able to not only compete in there, but be in these other countries and learn these other cultures and um, learn about different things within the cultures and learn, you know, our privilege here in America, how much like our poor people have cars and roofs and there's other people that don't have running water or roofs or they they don't even have a bicycle um to 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 understand that and be just grateful for the things that we have here i think those are the biggest experience being able to go around the world and see the world and experience that i always tell people if you can travel the world um travel as young as you can um because it changes the way that you kind of look at the world and i was blessed to be able to do that and not have to pay for it um, through Taekwondo and through being able to do these tournaments. Of course, what was that transition like after the Olympics and life after the Olympics? Uh, for me, it wasn't as hard as for other people because we had a plan. Um, I always knew that in 2012, I was going to retire. We, we had that conversation in around 2010, me and my coach. Um, at the time, we had the conversation, wherever we end, this is where we're going to end it. Um, and so I had already had things in place um, and I already had, uh, you know, people that were going to support me. I think the hardest part was figuring out who I was outside of Taekwondo. Um, I had always been the Taekwondo girl. I mean, I started from nine. So my identity was very, really connected to being um, a Taekwondo athlete, whether it was before the Olympics or after. And so transitioning out of that was was a little bit weird and finding where I was at and finding my career. Um, I had to go back to school. Um, you know, I started working a, a 7.25 an hour job. Like um, I also had just become a mom. Uh, so uh, all those things was just a just trans tra transition. Um, and I always tell people like that was my first life. Um, and then I lived the second life. And I think I'm currently in the third life. I just, uh, my daughter just graduated and went to college. And so now I'm an empty nester. So I feel like I'm going into my third life um, where these transitions just change. Uh, you know, how I moved and how I navigate and just figuring out what that next thing was. Um, but it took me a little bit. I did uh, go through therapy. Um, I did uh, make sure that I talked to the right people. I got around the right people uh, to help me through that transition. Um, because without that, it would have been super hard. That's why you a lot of times see athletes go back after retirement, um, because that transition is super hard for a lot of athletes. Uh, and it's a hard thing to 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 describe to people. Um, because they're like, why would you want to do all that stuff again? But when that's all you know, that's all you know. And so I did have a, a struggle to transition, but I successfully did not go back to Taekwondo. Uh, <laughs> and successfully stay retired. I will be retired for 20 years next year. I might do a party. <laughs> of course, what are some of the things that you're doing now after your life of Taekwondo? Um, uh, so as far as my career, I work for Visa, um, which I'm, I was part of an amazing program. Um, Visa does with Olympians and Paralympians. Um, they allow us to come in through this rotational program and learn 
um, about payments and learn about the company. Um, and then from there, find jobs within the company. So I'm super appreciative of Visa in general for even having that program. Um, because as you probably can guess, my resume it has a big gap in the beginning of it. And so um, Visa understood the intangible things that uh, we bring to the table and they utilize it. And so now I'm here, I, I'm about to make three years here at Visa. Um, but I also do things with the uh, within Visa with the Black Employee Research Group. Um, where I, you know we do things voluntarily out and do things amongst each other, um, and I'm part also part of the Houston Olympians uh, chapter where we um, do things within the Olympics. We do Olympic Day events with kids. We volunteer. Um, we work together. So I'm I'm trying to dabble in a little bit more things. But like I said, I'm an empty nester. Um, so I really want to get back into my community even more so um, with different activities and different groups that I'm a part of. Of course, being a retired athlete and still being involved in Taekwondo, what is that like getting to see what Taekwondo is like now versus when you were an athlete in Taekwondo? It's it's amazing to see the evolution. Um, as technology improves and we do things, we see the, the evolution of how people adjust. Um, for me, it's super funny because the style that is out now is very similar to the style I had when it wasn't cool. Uh, and so... Um, I'm, I, I kind of, I kind of fought like how they fight now. And so it's interesting to see how that is the norm where it was weird when I did it. Uh, and so I love it. I love seeing the evolution of it. Is there some things that I don't hundred uh, percent like? Yes. Um, but there's some great things that have come out of there. There's some cool things that have come out of there. I love especially seeing how much, uh, Taekwondo is being put on the TV, um, you know, is being streamed, you know, the, the the Olympics I went to, you had to wake up at three o'clock in the morning and watch it on Telemundo to watch it. And now they have Taekwondo on in prime time. And so to be able to see like that, you can stream tournaments now. Um, stuff that we didn't have. I, I love seeing that and I love the exposure that Taekwondo is getting and hopefully um we'll get more exposure to show how great the sport is and how fun the sport is. Of course, now that you're retired, are there any future plans of maybe getting into coaching? taekwondo privately or anything like that so that's what i did originally i, I had a taekwondo school um, um unfortunately i had to cut close it down uh to go to school i couldn't do both um and so uh there it's always a plan that you know i have a curriculum i have a full i call it nia usa curriculum um from i i got from white belt to black belt so i've successfully got uh, a few black belts uh under my belt um, but I had to really figure out myself um, as far as my career. Um, and so I buckled down and went to school and then uh, started working on my career. Um, in 2019, I was trying to start opening it again, but then COVID hit and um, it was just not uh, responsible for me to to open anymore. Um, but it's always a possibility in the future for me to pull out that old curriculum and, and start us back up. Um, but I really want to kind of establish myself and make sure that, you know, I'm good uh, professionally and, uh, you know, uh, uh, socially before I opened up a Taekwondo school, but I would love to do it. I did coach for a little bit also. I was part of the cadet uh, national team, um, but again, I had to really make, I had to make priorities um, and focus on uh, the things that will help me and build me up before I can try to build other people up. Of course, what was that experience like for you getting to coach those young athletes of Taekwondo and teaching them what you learned as an Olympian? I loved it. And again, a, a lot of the things that I love about doing these things is not the actual in the ring stuff. Like, of course, I love watching them in the ring and stuff like that and training them, but I love being able to impart things within these young athletes. And um, it's little stuff like if they're nervous, how do they get through that? Um, how do you get through the nervous jitters or, you know, how do you not overthink or, you know, how do you warm up and how do you prepare for yourself mentally? How do you cut weight? Uh, I, I love being able to be a part of that um, and really helping them understand the importance of curfews, why we have curfews, not just because we don't want you to have fun, but what, how does that affect you in the ring the, the next day? Um, why is that important? Why is what you eat is important? Why is what you drink is important? Like all those things I got to impart, those were the, the coolest part of being the coach on that level. What advice do you give those people that are looking to get into Taekwondo? Um, the first thing I would I would say is um, look for somewhere local first. Um, 
uh, try to see if they are in the, uh, if you want to do it Olympic style, try to make sure that they are with USAT. Um, I think you can go to the USA Taekwondo website and uh, look up schools under that are registered under them. The cool thing about USA Taekwondo is they have to go through safe sport, which means that um, they 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 have uh, gone through the training and the background checks to make sure that they are not harming anybody um, and they don't have any blemishes in their background. Um, all schools do not have that, but if they're under USA Taekwondo, you can guarantee the safety. Um, and so I always tell people to go through USAT just for that sake. Um, and then find a school that's local to you and ask for a, 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 a demonstration class. They Most schools will do a demonstration class, um, uh, especially if they're legit schools, um, and see if you even like it before you even decide to commit to anything. See how you like it, see how you like the, the basics. Um, and understand that you gotta crawl before you walk. Like the very first basic things are learning how to do the basic kicks and um, being patient with yourself. Um, it took me three years to get my black belt. Um, and so, and that's a long time in Taekwondo. So um, making sure that you give yourself time to develop um, and, and look to the future for uh, what you can do. Um, and as you start going on the road, as you get better and stuff like that, just start going to tournaments, um, finding out what those, what that pathway is. Uh, USAT always posts on online what the pathway is to get to the Olympics. And so seeing what that pathway is and understanding it and following it um, to try to get yourself to that level. What advice would you have those people that are in Taekwondo looking to compete for the Olympics for the first time? Um, like I said, make sure you know the path. Um, understand the path um, and do what you can to do those paths. Um, don't let one one loss uh, deter you. Um, just keep going on the path. Do what you can. Um, look at everything, whether you win or lose, as a lesson. Um, one of my favorite sayings is if, if what you did yesterday still looks good today, you haven't done much today. Uh, so I live by that even today where, you know, cool, you did that, but what can you do next? Always have that grind mentality, always want to do work, um, be, be the first person there, the last person to leave, um, and then understand your limitations. You don't have to compete or fight like anybody else. Um, find out what you're good at, uh, get really, really good at that and make them fight in, in the style that you are good at. Um, I always tell people, do not try to, um, you know, compete against somebody in their in their best style. Make them compete against you in your best um, and, and hone in on that. What advice would you give those Olympians that are looking to go through that transition process like you did and into retirement after their sport? I would say for all Olympians, look on our um, Olympic site. Um, there are uh, there are options, especially now, even more so now, of you know therapy options. Um, if you have your own personal therapy, make sure you have therapy and make sure you have a plan. Uh, don't start planning retirement the year that you're going to retire, but start planning um, and getting those goose eggs and understanding what you're going to do next before retirement. Look into programs. Uh, I it, I can do a, a call out. Visa always has that program. So any retired athletes that want to come to Visa, um, y'all can reach out to me uh, if you want to um, and, and come on to Visa because that's a great opportunity. But there's other opportunities out there. But having a plan is the key. Um, and then having somebody that you can go to to, to walk you through that transition because it's going to be hard no matter who you are. That's great advice. Where can my listeners find you at on social media? So you can find me on Instagram at Nia Abdallah, um, you, or the real Nia Abdallah. Um, I'm on Facebook under my name Nia Abdallah, um, and I'm on TikTok, uh, uh, Olympic silver medalist TKD. Uh, so you can find me on any of those. Um, also on LinkedIn under my name, you can find me if you want to reach out. Um, I'm pretty friendly. I I answer uh, as quick as I can. So um, if you want to send me a message, please send me a message, um, and I'll, I'll be sure to answer it. Thank you again, Anil Adabla, for your interview, and best of luck in your future, wherever it may hold you. Thank you. You can find Brandon Sports Talk on Instagram at Brandon Sports Talk, Twitter at Talk underscore Brandon, and you can find me on YouTube at Brandon Sports Talk. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Thank you again, Anil Adabla, for your interview, and best of luck in your future. You've been watching Brandon Sports Talk. Please feel free to like, share, and subscribe to Brandon Sports Talk on social media and on YouTube.